at the beginning of our life, our first cell contained information on how to grow into a much larger and more complex structure, leave the womb, and then effectively cope with any imaginable threat in the outside world for a whole century. But in our early days, we had no reason to suspect that our lives would mostly be lived outside our mother. She was our entire universe, in which we felt safe. Nothing could signal that we would be leaving soon, and that the first days after our birth would be the most dangerous ones, not only in our lives, but also in lives of our mothers. Whoever witnessed a birth must have felt that it is a truly awkward evolutionary solution. It is stressful, painful, exhausting and life-threatening. For many of us in high-income countries, the day of new arrival to our family is often the most joyous and anticipated and the wonderful day. But for so many people in low- and middle-income countries, it is often the most dreaded and fearful and the worst day. More than half a million women lose their life every year all over the world by giving birth. What is it that makes it so dangerous? They often can't give birth in a safe, sterile environment, so they risk contracting life-threatening infections. They lack access to skilled birth attendants and simple medicines, so they risk bleeding to death or obstruction of the child in the birth canal. Sadly, too many young women still die because of unsafe abortion. Because of this, securing a safe and sanitary environment for giving birth with a skilled birth attendant is one of the most basic human rights that we should all be striving for. And maternal deaths are just the most horrific tip of the iceberg. For every woman who dies during childbirth, up to seven more will have complications that would haunt them for a lifetime as a result of poor care during delivery. Mothers who gave birth while malnourished have weakened immunity and depleted reserve systems. This leads them to prolonged poor health. Empowering women in poor countries to take control over when to have children would help prevent many of those problems. At the end of the millennium, we knew that there were about 11 million children dying all over the world every year. But where, how and why exactly? It was difficult to accept that no one really knew. It took a meticulous analysis of 40 years of world's biomedical literature, spanning from 1960 to 2000, to identify only about 200 studies that properly documented the causes of child deaths. A sophisticated analysis of the available data, which was only performed in the early 21st century, began to reveal many truly unexpected and deeply concerning findings. Firstly, the typical infectious diseases of early childhood such as measles, pertussis or neonatal tetanus, along with HIV and malaria, could jointly account for only about one in six of all child deaths. What were the other five caused by then? It turned out that nearly half of child deaths globally were caused by the two other infectious diseases that very few people studied or prioritized for funding childhood pneumonia and diarrhea. The second surprise came when we realized that the key question wasn't about what happened to the children who died, but rather when did it happen? Every second death of preschool children in the world happened in the very first month of their life, and many of those on the very first day. Clearly, the dangers faced by a mother during childbirth were often deadly for a child, too. But in yet another twist, more research showed that the count of child deaths in the world was still incomplete. There were babies that died without even reaching the stage of birth. Stillbirth is a term that describes a death of a baby who has been alive in mother's womb for at least 28 weeks or reached the weight of one kilogram, but died before the end of the pregnancy. 
It is estimated that around 2.6 million stillbirths occur each year and the vast majority, about 98% of them, takes place in low and middle income countries. These causes perhaps accounted for the large majority of child deaths. But there was another cause underlying them all, undernutrition. Lack of food had some role in at least a third of all childhood deaths. But the harm that it caused was much wider. Undernutrition in childhood leads not only to stunted growth, but it may also have important implications for the future economic and social development. This may affect individuals and families, but also the whole countries and continents. Preventable deaths of mothers and children are the worst problem, but they are not the only problem. Many children are exposed to multiple risk factors that interfere with their optimal growth and development. Life in extreme poverty, neglect in unstimulating home environments, insufficient nutrition, the energy expended on fighting life-threatening infections may all have negative effect on child's development. It is estimated that nearly one in three children of preschool age are not fulfilling their physical, mental and social development potential. The final surprise was the insight that we had interventions available to avoid child deaths all along. We could prevent infections with recently developed vaccines or treat them using extremely cheap and affordable antibiotic treatments and oral rehydration sachets. A plan was urgently needed, not only on how to find the money for these interventions, but also how to deliver them to the children in need. And then, yet again, we realized that things are far from simple. Some of those microbes that we intended to keep away from our children have clearly been our highly visible enemies, but many more microbes that would end up collateral victims in this fight have been serving us for our evolution as our good, loyal and invisible friends.